Hello, I'm Gavin Clark, and I'm here with the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is, of course, famous for uh, many things, but including which is Colossus, one of the machines that helped break German military communications during the Second World War. Uh, one of the driving powers of Colossus was the valve. Uh, we get a lot of questions at the museum about valves, and we've been asking people to send us their questions online via Twitter with the hashtag AskTNMOC. Uh, they've come up again. You'll be surprised to learn. We had a question from Jim. Perhaps you can explain the role of the valve in these enormous machines. I understand they were used as some kind of switch. If they were, how were they synced up? Now, I'm here with Andrew Herbert, former Microsoft Research Cambridge and volunteer at the museum. Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about what is a valve? Um, I suppose the big mystery for people is how do they relate to modern electronics as we know them now? And finally, I suppose, what consequences that did they have at the time for the way you would design a machine? Because if we get this thing in people's minds, essentially, it looks like a light bulb. So take it away, Andrew. OK, good questions, Gavin. Um, you were almost there with the, the last part of the question. And you can think of a valve as a transistor inside a light bulb. Mm. That's basically what it is. Um, from a logical point of view, it does the same job. Um, it's something which can be switched on or off and you've got two states, so it can represent one or zero. And a transistor is like that. Um, a transistor has three electrodes, they're called emitter, collector, and base. Um, a valve has essentially three electrodes um, called anode, cathode, and grid, and they do very analogous jobs. Um, essentially, if you put a current on the grid, which would be the base in a transistor, it switches the device off or on, depending on the, the precise nature of the valve. Um, there were more complicated valves with additional electrodes, but we kind of don't have to go there to answer this question. Um, now the difference, um, and the reason why the light bulb analogy is, is even better, is for a valve to work, its electrodes have to be heated. And so there's actually a heating coil in there as well um, to keep it hot. Um, and so that makes it physically large, it makes it physically hot, it drinks a lot of electricity. Um, I'm involved in the EDSAC Reconstruction Museum, and that's a reconstruction machine from 1949. Mm. And when the thing is fully running, it consumes about nine kilowatts of power. That's nine electric fires all running. So it gets quite toasty even in the winter. Um, so um, that's kind of the Achilles heel of the valve-based computers and why when transistors became available, we rushed to them. And of course, in modern computers, all those transistors are inside microchips, so we can have even more of them. Um, mm. With valve-based machines, even quite simple circuits took up physically a large space to build what we call a gate, which is the fundamental logic building block of a computer, is often three or four valves. Um, so you're talking of you know, an area that measures six inches by four inches by the time you've put them together and wired them up. Um, so if you imagine trying to build a computer memory out of valves, it would be the size of several aircraft hangers just to assemble a, a, a few thousand words, maybe of 18 bits or something like that. Um, so it wasn't feasible in the very earliest machines that were built using valves to do things in parallels. We're doing modern machines. Um, so you didn't, for example, in the early machines have a bus um, so that data could be moved around inside the machine in, in bytes or words. Mm. Most of them were built as what we called serial machines. And what that meant was in the main processor, particularly in, in the arithmetic, the machine computed on one bit at a time. It kind of did arithmetic the way that primary school children do. It would first, it's in binary, but imagine it was decimal. It would first work on the units, and then remember the carry, and then work on the tens, adding in the carry, and then work on the hundreds, and so on. And each of those was a, was a cycle through the machine. So serial arithmetic is, is quite slow, but you only need enough valves to look after one bit at a time. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, what do you do with the bits you're not working on? You've got to put them somewhere. Um, so in many of the early machines, they came up with different kinds of technology to remember what was in memory as a flow of bits going round in some way. Um, you could do it mechanically on the surface of a rotating drum. 
And that had its limits because you can only make a mechanical thing go so fast. Um, and that's you know, analogous to a, a modern disc in some ways. Um, in EDSAC, they use long tubes filled with mercury. And because um, if, you, if you pulse the mercury, the pulse travels through it at the speed of sound. In a five foot tube of mercury, you can remember slightly under 600 bits. And so that gives you a memory. Um, and when your bit has traveled all the way to the end of the tube, you then have to ping the tube again to send it round and the thing is continually recirculating. So in the early machines like EDSAC and many others, the arithmetic was done serially. And one of the big challenges was synchronizing the, the arithmetic circuits to the memory circuits. Um, and indeed that is in many ways the most complex part of the EDSAC machine is to maintain that synchronization because you've got to remember where your data is in the tube as it recirculates and wake the arithmetic unit up when your data becomes available. Um, in more yeah. modern machines, all that has, has gone away because with microchips, we can afford to have memories entirely constructed out of semiconductors um, without having to you know, hire an aircraft hangar first. And just, I suppose, uh, one final thought uh, on EDSAC, how many valves are we talking about? And what's the physical, what would be the physical size of the machine that you're rebuilding, which of course matches the original? Um, so it's about three and a half thousand valves. Um, the machine fills an area about 20 feet square. And you know, all the metal work to hold the shelves on which we put the circuits with the valves and the valves themselves weighs about two tons. So it's, it's a physically very large and substantial machine. Um, and even an individual chassis that fits on the rack is about three foot long and has about 20 to 25 valves on it. Um, it's a noticeable thing to pick up. I mean, it, it doesn't blow away and fall on the floor like a microchip does when you sneeze. And if you drop it on your foot, it hurts. You are going to notice, yes. <laughs>